Hello everybody! It's time for a one year and two months ownership experience update with my 2022 Hyundai Ioniq 5. Um, in case you didn't know, I got one of those and I've had it since February of 2022. I was one of the very first people in my area to get one. Um, and so I want to bring you along with an overview of everything that has happened in that year and two months. Overall, I have been extremely pleased with the car. I would not trade it in for anything else. Um, so just to start this off, it's been mostly wonderful. There have only been two problems with the car that are its fault, and they're both very minor. One is, I don't know if you would call it minor, but I had a very easy way to fix it. And the other one is more of an inconvenience that it is um, an earth shattering problem. I will get to that in a bit, but first I wanna talk about the reason this is a one year and two month update and not a one year update. As it turns out, two days after the one year anniversary of me getting the car, I decided to take the car to a car wash. Um, my, the color on my car, the uh, shooting star matte gray, according to Hyundai, cannot go through a mechanical tunnel style car wash. I learned this when I was sitting in the car after I had signed all the paperwork and the salesman was doing the tour that they do. Um, that's kind of a bummer. I don't mind having to wash the car by hand all that much. Uh, my biggest concern is I like to take cars through tunnel car washes a lot in the winter because we salt the roads here. And I think that doing that to get an underbody undercarriage rinse to get the salt off can really prolong the life of your car. And I really can't do it with this car because of that color. Um, I have been, I keep, I'm on the fence of whether or not one day I'm just gonna try it and see what happens. The reason why they tell you you can't is because if you go through a car wash that isn't, and I should say it can actually go through a car wash so long as it's a touchless car wash and it doesn't use a wax shiny product because the whole thing with the, with the finish of the paint, it's a really cool looking finish. It's striking in person but it's not shiny. So if you add a product to it that makes it shiny, you've kind of ruined the paint. And if you go through a car wash that has brushes and they scratch the surface, you can't buff it out without again, making the paint shiny and ruining the finish. Supposedly I had heard in one video, I don't know whether or not this is true, that Hyundai is proud of their matte paints for 2023 model year cars. I first saw this on a preview of the Ionic 6 because they can go through a tunnel car wash. So that makes me wonder, is that true for my car too or not? I have been, I've, I've not dared to do it. So I've been washing my car in a manual wash bay and I just spray around the wheels as much as I can, hopefully to get any salt off. Although this winter has been weirdly mild and I haven't been driving in mucky roads much at all. Um, anyway, so I decided one evening to take the car to a car to my local car wash, which isn't that local because there's not that many uh, manual car washes around me. Um, and on my way back from washing the car, wind blew a garbage can into the road and there was too much traffic around me for me to really do anything to avoid it. So I decided to just hit it and see what happens. Um, that caused a very, very tiny amount of damage. Basically, it scuffed up the corner of the car. I have a picture. It scuffed up the corner and the bumper cover got popped out just a little bit. It was the kind of damage where it's like almost not even noticeable, but knowing how much body work can cost, I thought I better make a claim with my insurance company. So I did and they got back with an estimate and it would be over a thousand dollars out of pocket to repair. So. I decided let's go ahead and get this taken care of. That did not go that smoothly. And this is nothing to do with the car. This is to do with the state of the industry right now, as far as I can tell. So my insurance company wanted me to use one of two, actually there was a third option, but there was only one. I think it was an independent shop, it was nowhere near me. So they wanted me to use one of two bigger uh, shop chains in the area. And the first one, my preferred shop, I called them, explained it's very, very minor damage. You're not gonna need to do any sort of structural work to the car, it's just plastic. Um, and he was like, okay, send me the estimate from your insurance company. 
I emailed it to the guy and he got back to me within minutes and said, we don't work on electric cars. Okay, that sucks. And also maybe you should, because I don't know if you've noticed, but there's more and more of these on the road and it's gonna be an existential problem for you if you don't decide to start working on these cars. Um, so my second option, I actually got to the point of arranging the car to be repaired and then out of, out of the blue, they claimed that they could not get a part that they needed because they were not certified. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. And from what I've heard from the shop who eventually did fix my car, I don't think that was true. I think they just didn't want to fix it for some strange reason. Uh, so the repair process was just kind of up in the air for a while. I kind of just gave up. I was working with my insurance company. And I said, look, I gotta, I gotta find someone who can fix the car. So what I ended up doing was I just called my dealer and said, who, who can you recommend to fix this car? And they recommended a body shop. I called the body shop and the body shop was like, yeah, sure, drop it off on Monday. And I, I was like, don't, don't you want to see the car? Cause I've gotten two people who will not repair the car. And they were like, sure, bring it over. And it was, it was the same thing. I think I brought it over on Thursday he looked at the car, he's like, yeah, sure, just bring it in Monday, we'll take care of you. And uh, they had it fixed by Friday. So I don't know what the heck was going on with the first two shops, but this is to say that the people are spooked by electric cars doing body work. I can sort of get it if it were like a big accident and they would have to straighten the frame or <laughs> they don't have frames anymore, but straighten the body, do some sort of actual uh, body work like that. But for the tiny little thing that I had, it was just replacing a couple of plastic parts and doing touch-up work. I don't know why it was so difficult to get that repaired. So I do want to say that right now we are in this weird state where certain people don't want to touch electric cars for reasons unknown. And the second shop who didn't, uh, who we almost went with um, until they just were like, no, we can't work on it. Okay. Um, they have a location which is certified to work on Teslas and they actually bothered to find out would they be able to work on the car and they also said no. So I don't know what the deal was, if they thought the estimate was too low or what, but they just wouldn't touch my car. But luckily the, the third shop pulled through for me. I'm happy with the work they did on the car and that's the end of that. So, um, the, the most trouble I've had with the car has nothing to do with the car. Like it's not the car's fault at all. Um, I hit a trash can and I needed the tiniest amount of body work done and nobody wanted to do it, which is bonkers. Um, but that's, that's honestly the, the biggest issue I've had with the car. And like I said, it's not the car's fault. So I can't really blame the car for that at all. Um, but it's all fixed and uh, also, here's a fun thing that was happening. So I have the Blue Link, which is Hyundai's connected app thing. It's like their version of OnStar. And the app tells me when the car is unlocked, which is actually kind of annoying. I might talk about that later. But I was able to tell when they were working on the car. And what was really cool was at some point when they removed the front bumper, they turned on the car with the front bumper disattached, I think. Um, because that set some codes. There are the active grille shutters in the bumper and that set codes in the car. And what's really cool is the Blue Link app actually tells you what the DTCs are, which is awesome. You don't need a code scanner to get the trouble codes out of the car so long as you have the app and are, you know, it comes with like three years of free connectivity. So that's really cool. I am quite, yes, because I had the Volt, the Volt, the Volt has the silliest, it does the silliest thing. The uh, prior to 2014, I think the uh, charge door popper was electronic and they would tend to stick. And if you did three pops of the button and it didn't open, that would set a trouble code which turned on the check engine light. It was nuts. And um, the app never told me like what that was for. I had to use a code scanner to pull it out. That was the the silliest thing about that car like okay sure set a trouble code if you want about like charge door actuation performance or something like that but don't don't turn on the check engine light that was just stupid um but yeah that's a really cool thing is that it was able to 
the DTCs were in there and I was able to look them up and it was like related to the active grill shutters. So, and then by the time the car was returned to me, the shop had cleared those codes and everything is hunky dory. So anyway, that's enough about that experience. Uh, let's talk about the two problems. So the first is the 12 volt battery discharge bug. This is affecting a lot of people with Hyundai Ionic 5s. It doesn't seem to affect the other versions of the eGMP platform cars as much. Um, and in my case, I don't think I was affected by the thing that most people have been. Uh, so what happened to me was I, this was last summer, I think, the car, I had left the hatch open in the garage. And the reason I did that was because I was being lazy and I had a cooler back there with the um, ice packs inside the cooler and I just wanted to leave the cooler open and let the ice packs thaw and I wanted to let air flow into the car. It was silly, I shouldn't have done that. But when I went back out to the car the next morning, I hit the button to shut the trunk and nothing happened. I didn't realize that the car was dead. It was completely dead. Um, so I hooked a jump pack up to the car, which quickly woke it up, turned the car on and left it on for not that long. I didn't leave it on for long enough uh, as it would turn out. Um, I think I left it on for like 15 minutes. Uh, so I turned the car back off, closed it up, and then later that evening it was dead again because I didn't leave it on for long enough. Um, I put an ammeter around the battery cable to see how many amps were going into the battery. It was only like 20 amps. So the battery was not the 12 volt battery. I should say, if for those who are not familiar, most electric cars, um, I think I think all electric cars have some low voltage battery. Um, most, it's just a regular 12 volt lead acid battery. And that battery is there because everything that's not the traction motors or the air conditioning or the heater will operate on 12 volts. Like um, Hyundai's not gonna get window regulators that run on 800 volts and they're not gonna run 800 volt wiring through all the cars. So most of the car systems are still 12 volts and that starter battery is used to wake up the car. So effectively it closes the high voltage contactors inside the battery pack and from that point, the DC to DC converter wakes up, performs the same sort of tasks as an alternator, and then the 12 volt battery is just there, the heart of the 12 volt system. So in the Ionic 5, people have been having issues with the 12 volt battery just randomly discharging, and then the car is dead and you have to jump it like you would a internal combustion car with a dead 12 volt battery. Um, so, uh, sorry, I went out of order there. So it was not charging the battery that fast. So when I got it rebooted the second time, I left the car on for, I think, 45 minutes. I made sure the 12 volt battery could charge up. And then from that day, I've not had the issue again. So what we have found out, um, the Ionic guy, he's another YouTuber who's been really in depth with the car. He got to the bottom of, well, um, he was in contact with Hyundai and they claim that what's causing this is Hyundai has allowed people to sign up with Blue Link or sign up with their utilities to do a sort of like demand charging system so they could delay charging if the grid demand was high through Blue Link. And some of those third party apps were pulling the car way too often. They said like 20,000 pulls every day. And so every time the that system would ask the car what's going on it would wake up the um, blue link system but that wouldn't turn on the high voltage system to recharge the 12 volt battery so that would kill the car i don't know if you heard that reads at the top of the stairs meowing at me um that would not explain what happened to me because i've not had any third party apps like that um all i have is the blue link app and i think it was just because I left the trunk open all night. Um, there was also speculation that it was something to do with the charge port door. Whatever happened to me, it only happened one time. After that, I did an infotainment system update um, because that we can do at home. It's a little bit not so elegant. You need a flash drive that you can, you know, actually burn the data onto and plug into the infotainment system, but we can do that at home. Since I've done that, 
I've not had that issue again. And there is a light on the dashboard that comes on when the high voltage system is awake, just to, I don't really know why it's there, but if that light is on, you know that the car is charging the 12 volt battery. I've seen that light more often after doing that update. And uh, so I think that update had something to do with it. In any case, that issue affected me one time. Um, that's it though. And so I don't know if it's okay to call it fixed, but it has it has not really been affecting me. And, and sometimes I leave the car, sometimes I don't use the car for four or five days at a time and I've not had any issues. So yeah, that happened to me. That is more, that is a, you know, potentially a big problem because the car is dead. You need some way to jumpstart it. So I would say at this point, I've kept a, I've had a 12 volt jump pack on me ever since I've had the Volt because you're, most um, hybrids and EVs, you're not supposed to jump another car with them. And when I worked in the hotel industry, uh, jump-starting guests' cars was something that happened every once in a while. So I wanted a jump pack so I could help out other guests. And I've had that same jump pack since 2015, I think, um, and still kicking. So I used it to, to turn the car back on. So I think everybody should have one of those jump packs. Um, but if you're considering this car, you definitely should have one of those jump packs just in case this problem's not fixed. Then the other problem that I've had with the car, this is really just an inconvenience, but it could be problematic depending on your situation. The charge scheduling is just not reliable. So you can, through the infotainment system, say, I only want you to charge between these hours, which is what I do for um, my time of use rates with the utility. So I had it set up, I only want you to charge between, I think 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. or something like that. I, I wanted it to start charging at 11. I may have made it midnight, I'm not sure. Um, before, and this is the weird thing, before I did that software update, it worked perfectly. I never had any issues. After I did the software update to the infotainment system, on two occasions, the next day, it had not charged. And after the second time, I was, the first time it happened, I was able to reset the infotainment system. There is actually a, a, a recessed reset button, like like in the good old days on, on the climate controls uh, panel, which will reset the infotainment screen, which is awesome. That fixed it once. But after the second time, it just didn't charge. I waited until, like I stayed up till 11 o'clock or whatever I told it I wanted it to charge by. And again, it just forgot to start charging. Um, so I don't rely on that anymore, unfortunately. I have, I set an alarm on my phone when I'm gonna plug it in. Um, and I just remember, you know, I'll set an alarm for like 10 p.m. and I'll plug it in at 10. That's a disappointment. Um, and if you were at 20% state of charge and you absolutely needed it to start charging, but you delayed it until midnight, it, you could be in, in a jam there. So, um, because I haven't been relying on it since like, I want to say July or August, maybe it's gotten better, but I haven't done a software update to my car. So I don't know enough about how that system works, um, to comment on it. So yeah, it's just unfortunate because first of all, the way that system was set up was wonky. You had to put in a departure time, which I, I didn't care about because like what you can do is you can say, oh, I leave at 8 a.m. I wanna make sure you're done charging by then. I didn't care about that. I just wanted to limit its charge hours to you know X to X, but you have to put in a departure time before you can do that. So that was clunky. The, the car's biggest weakness is there's the software is a little rough around the edges. Um, but in a lot of ways, I don't really care about that. But that particular issue is a problem. I don't know if Hyundai's in the process of fixing it. I'm, there are updates available for the car, but they're not the infotainment updates. Um, I've not taken it to the dealer to get some updates that it can get yet because they're, they're, they're not important to me. So I will do that eventually. Um, yeah, I, but I guess I'll talk about that later. Uh, okay, so those are the only two issues. The 12 volt battery bug, which affected me once. It has affected some people a lot, but it sounds like Hyundai has mostly gotten to the bottom of it. And the charge scheduling. 
those are the only two true issues I've had with the car, other than a few glitches, which I'll talk about later. Um, and so I'll call that a win. It has really been... I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent here. So there have been people I follow online who have gotten new, um, new electric cars from a certain brand that have had a lot of little things go wrong in the first year and that they've taken them to service centers um, and like just a lot of things were not buttoned up perfectly when the car was made from the factory or that they had some something actually go wrong which required service and my experience when buying when owning a new car going back to when I was a kid because for, I mean, I shouldn't say that my parents are always getting new cars, but like going back to the 99 Accord is the first new car that I remember. It has been my experience that you buy a car new, nothing should go wrong with it for a few years. And that's been my experience with every car that I have either been in the, like my parents have gotten or that I got later, uh, there should be no problems for the first two or three years. That I think is the expectation and people who get a new car and have to send it in for all these little service things, um, I don't think that's acceptable. Include, so uh, my, the Volt, my 2015 Volt, not a single thing went wrong with that. I bought that car used, not a single thing went wrong with that car until, I think I talked about this somewhere on the channel, until I went to sell it. Uh, the low coolant warning, that's a known issue with the car, showed up for me literally like when I was going to sell it prior to getting this car. Um, but that was a relatively simple fix. The TSB from GM took care of that. Uh, the blue Chevy Bolt that my parents have, they still have, it's still kicking. Nothing has gone wrong with that car. Uh, there was one random error that showed up uh, gosh, when was that? It was a few years old at that point, which required a trip to the dealer to reset something. Um, but as far as mechanical issues, there's been none. Other than, of course, the battery pack recall, but that affected every single bolt. So it's not like it affected their car specifically. They even had a 2015 Equinox, Chevy Equinox, which had no problems from 2015 to 2021 when they sold it. So to me, it's just like, if you buy a new car from any brand and you have serious issues in the first couple years, like, uh, that's, you shouldn't accept that. That shouldn't be good. Um, so I'm not really surprised that the car has been flawless for the first year because that's just been my experience. Even, even a Chrysler. There was a Chrysler in our family back when I was in middle school. That car did not have anything go wrong with it for three years. It did have a catastrophic engine failure at about 45,000 miles <laughs> when it was four or five years old. Um, but three years trouble-free. And I feel like that's a pretty low bar. Anyway, I've been talking about that for a while. Um, so we talked about the collision repair experience. Other issues I've had with the car, which are not the car's fault at all. I had, I had a run of bad luck with this car as far as just like road hazards. Um, I got a nail in the right rear tire uh, I have no idea where I got that. I was out doing errands and I was leaving the parking lot of Trader Joe's, I think, and then the uh, um, the low tire pressure warning came on. Lovely that that's a thing now. I know some people are still grumpy that cars have to have that, but hey, it saved my bacon because I would not have known that tire was running low. Um, I got home with about 20 pounds in it and I inflated the tire back up because I could not see a nail. I must have been, I must have had the car parked on it. Uh, and then I took it outside while watching the live tire pressure display and saw it was dropping by a pound about every two minutes and said, okay, there's something in the tire. Um, so that happened ugh, right before Christmas. And so I needed to get a new tire. That was like $250 all in because I have the big wheels. They're not cheap tires. Uh, and then the other thing was I got um, a scuff on the paint, unfortunately. So again, talking about that matte paint. Um, 
on, I think it was I-55, it was going through a construction zone and a car in front of me kicked up a piece of asphalt that scraped across my hood. So there is a small blemish on the hood of the car and because of the matte paint, I can't really do anything about it. It's very minor in the grand scheme, uh, but when the light hits it, it kind of looks like there's a piece of bird poop on the car. <laughs> I keep waffling back and forth between, maybe I will get the car repainted at some point or just put a clear coat on the matte paint and stop worrying about the finish. But I do really like the way it looks, so for now I'm tolerating it. That I believe is is it as far as like as if, as far as money I've had to spend on the car um, other than electricity, it has been the five hundred dollar deductible from my from my insurance company and that new tire. That's it. Um, so if I didn't have the nail in the tire, it would have had no cost other than the collision repair. So I think that is all about I wanted to talk about with big problems. Now I want to talk about just my experience with the car. Um, I'm so happy with it. I really am. So unfortunately, I'm sure some people will be disappointed to hear this. Most, mostly I view cars as an appliance. And this is the real kicker. I wanted a crossover. I'm sorry, but my, my first car was a coupe with a, uh, you know, a regular trunk and I don't want a car with a trunk anymore. A sedan is certainly more useful than a coupe, but um, I want to, at the very least, I want a hatchback. And unfortunately, all the hatchbacks that are left in the market are just a little bit small for, for, my, for my desires. Uh, because I lived with the Bolt for so long, I just knew that car, because I do long highway trips between work and here, the studio, that car is just a little too small for that to be comfortable. The Volt was actually great. Um, the car, it, it was only about the size of a Civic. It, the Volt is really a, a Chevy Cruze that just has a different drivetrain in it and some different styling. And that car, I loved the way it rode. Um, it was still a little bit small for my liking, but, but part of why I didn't consider getting a Bolt of my own is just, it's for the kind of driving that I do, it's just a little bit too small, a little bit too rough. I haven't driven the current versions of the Bolt and I believe that they've been softened a bit from 2017, but I did want something a little more substantial. Um, and the Ionic 5 seemed to be a good fit for that. Uh, it is extremely comfortable. Um, it soaks up bumps very well. The seats are comfortable. Um, it's just very, very easy to live with. And it, it turns out is actually more of a crossover than most crossovers. And what I mean by that, it's actually like a crossover between a crossover and a car. It's somewhere in the middle. The rental I had during my repair was a RAV4. And I know that my car is like length and width. It's pretty close to a RAV4. Let me fact check that. So my car is 183 inches long by 74 inches wide. And let's just go with a 2021. So a RAV4 is 182 long by 73 wide. And my car is 183 long by 74 wide. So length and width, it's about identical to a Toyota RAV4, but it's nowhere near as tall. And I didn't realize that. Um, when I had that rental, it was like, wow, this thing feels much bigger than my car, even though dimensionally it's, as far as its footprint, it's virtually identical. but it's nowhere near as tall. I have that number here, why didn't I give it to you? My car is 63 inches tall, the RAV4 is as high as 69 inches tall. So it's only a six inch difference, but boy does it feel much taller. That, oh, I don't need to put my phone away, I just have to look at the document still. Um, but yes, uh, the way, it's just definitely for me. If you are, uh, if you like performance driving, it's probably not the car for you. And I will say that uh, some time ago, I was borrowing the Bolt again. Um, I had it for a few days and I had forgotten that car is fun to drive. Um, it's much zippier than my car. My car is faster zero to 60 by a good deal. It's like two or three seconds faster, but it's not tossable like the Bolt is and it is bigger. So the Bolt has a very go-karty type feel, which I understand it's fun, but 
as a for a daily driver that is just not what I want. So the the Ionic 5 is uh, much more serene, much more of a just cruiser than it is a fun go-karty type car. That's for me, that's what I wanted. Um, so I'm very, very satisfied with it. I will, however, say that despite the fact that I really don't care that much about how it handles, the, if you do hit a big bump on a curve, it, do, it does get unsettled. And it is... Um, I noticed people talking about this in reviews of the car. It is true that the, it, it's like unsettled is the only way to describe it. Um, it's not dangerous or anything, but it definitely feels like the car briefly was not going the way you expected it to go um, as the suspension gets itself, gets all four tires back, on, back onto the road. So um, if you're looking for a performance handling car, it ain't for you. But if you're looking for something that's comfortable, it's for you. Road trips in the car are great, and uh, its crazy long wheelbase means that um, the interior room is fantastic. Uh, however, the turning radius on the car is not great. It is not unacceptably bad, but I find myself doing three-point maneuvers in parking lots more than I expected that I would do. Um, so if you value a tight turning circle, it's not that tight, unfortunately. But that, where was I? Driving experience comfort. So um, compared to the Bolt, I already talked about this, it's not as fun to drive. The Bolt is is more of a fun go-kart, zippy, go-around-town car. The Ionic is just not that. Um, and comparing it to the Volt, the Gen 1 Volt, um, it is a little bit more comfortable. Uh, but the Volt didn't get that weird unsettledness, uh, at least I don't remember. Um, so it, it doesn't handle quite as well as the Volt, I don't think. Uh, but the car, as far as like, I I know I talked about it in this past, it's just, the it's like it was designed for me. I have been asking for the longest time for people to stop trying to make cars the sportiest things in the world. And the Ionic 5, they just did not try to make it that. They tried to make it more comfortable than sporty. At least that's how it feels to me. And for my daily driver, which is more of an appliance than anything else, it's exactly what I want. Um, so now let's talk about the efficiency. So in the 15,000 odd miles that I have had the car, it's averaging three miles per kilowatt hour. Uh, m most of that's highway driving, like... A lot of it is highway driving. Um, and I'm actually a little surprised it's that good. I'm pleasantly surprised it's that good. But three miles per kilowatt hour is where it has ended up. I just looked at the Bolt. Um, I was over at my parents and the Bolt with 55,000 uh, 55, miles. 53. So after 53,000 miles in five, five uh, this is either its fifth or sixth year, I'm not sure, um, it averaged 3.2 miles per kilowatt hour. Now, that's not a very big difference, 3 versus 3.2, but my car is a lot bigger than the Bolt. So why is that? Largely the heat pump. So my the, the Ionic 5's heat pump is excellent and I'm very very happy it has it. It basically when so long as the temperature is above it, it can be around freezing a little bit below freezing if it's there or above the the ambient temperature really does not affect range that much so long as you are starting with a battery that's not like iced up. Like if you if you can keep the car parked in a garage, it doesn't even necessarily need to be heated. So long as the battery is not cold soaked, ambient temperature really does not seem to affect range all that much until you're getting significantly below freezing, which is great. Um, when, throughout the winter, wind has been the by far the bigger factor than ambient temperatures. Um, so I'm super happy about that. The heat pump is making a huge difference. So the Bolt, because even though it is smaller, it's quite a lot smaller, and in the summer, it's it will get four miles per kilowatt hour on the highway, which the Ionic 5 will not. Um, the Bolt, on average, is only a little bit more efficient because every winter you start running the heat and that just saps so much energy out of the battery pack. 
saps. Zaps. That's the word I meant. Um, however, it's not all perfect. Um, once it gets below 25 Fahrenheit or so, the heat pump stops being that effective. And once you're below like 10 degrees Fahrenheit, it's not going to do anything. So, and the reason why I'm the reason why this is a big but is that this winter was freaky mild. It got really cold around Christmas, and then we had one other pretty cold snap in January. But other than that, this has been a very, very mild winter. Um, I used the snow blower twice. I didn't even run out. <laughs> I didn't even use up the gas that was left over from the last year in the tank. So this has been just a super, super mild winter. So I can't say that the car wouldn't um, lose efficiency or like, I can't say that three miles per kilowatt hour is a decent average in a cold climate. It may be skewed up. Um, and the reason why I, I think it's, I think it's fair to say that is that I did in January when it got cold again, I decided for grins and giggles to take the car on a fairly long highway stint of uh, 73-ish miles an hour when it was about five degrees Fahrenheit outside. And boy, did efficiency plummet. Uh, that trip averaged 2.1 miles per kilowatt hour. So like only two, th a little over two thirds Basically, that 30% range reduction that um, I talked about in the EV charging guide, you can expect a 30% range reduction when it gets that cold. However, while the heat pump wasn't really doing anything, the heat works great. Um, much, much better than the Bolt um, or even the Volt with the engine running. The car's heat, when it was that cold, uh, it was fantastic. And um, so it wasn't that efficient, but boy, was it cozy warm inside and with the heated steering wheel and all that stuff, it was great. So um, when it gets significantly below freezing, the heat pump doesn't really help, but because unless you live, you know, some parts of the country, yes, it gets well below freezing most of the winter, but even here around Chicago, um, on average, the winter days are usually 20 degrees Fahrenheit somewhere around there. So for much of the winter, the heat pump's gonna help a lot. And it like around, you know, it's really only the three darkest months of the winter that the heat pump may not do anything. Uh, fall and spring, whenever it gets chilly, it's gonna be great. So I'm definitely, every EV needs a heat pump. I'm super happy it has the heat pump. Okay, so with the efficiency discussion out of the way, which again, your mileage may vary, as they say, uh, let me talk about the um, highway driving assist system uh, and the glitches I've had with that. There have been two glitches that happened with that system. One happened way back in March, right after March of last year, right after I got the car. And then the second one happened this winter. Um, and then also I just talk about, let me first talk about the highway driving assistance system. Uh, so my car being the limited trim has HDA2. Um, I'm not well versed on the differences between two and one other than my car will do automatic lane changes. Um, which is, I mean, yes, it kind of does. It's, it's a little bit finicky. Um, but so my, the highway driving assistant feature, it is basically adaptive cruise control with aggressive lane centering. And with the, um, when you tap the turn signal stock, it will move itself into the next lane once it's safe to do so. That's really, really finicky because it wants to know that your hands are on the wheel before it makes a move. So I found that to get that to work, you kind of have to tap it and then give the wheel a bit of a nudge to reassure it that you are holding onto the wheel. And you have to be light in that nudge because if you do anything more than a nudge, it thinks you are giving it a deliberate steering input and then cancels the lane change. So I've, I have managed to get the finesse required to make that system work, but it really does require finesse. It's it's a little bit goofy, but um, the highway driving assist feature in general is excellent. Um, my mom and dad now have a, I'm not sure if it's a 21 or a 22, they have a, a Toyota Sienna, the, the first year where it's a hybrid now. And comparing its uh, 
adaptive cruise with lane centering to the Hyundai, my car is in general much better, especially the lane centering. Their van always feels like it's hugging the left side of the lane. And actually the, the RAV4 that was my rental when the car was getting fixed, it too was like, every time I turned on the lane tracing, it felt like it was way too far to the left. Um, my car does not, it feels very well centered. So I'm starting to think the Toyota system is indeed hugging the left side of the lane. Um, but the, the system is very, very good. It's like 95% good, but there are some minor quibbles I have with it, which I will talk about later. But at first I wanna talk about the glitches. So back in, I wanna say this was March, I was on the highway and I happened to be following a semi that was going just a hair slower than I had cruise control set to. So I decided to just follow it. Um, I wasn't drafting it. I, I had it, I was following it with the distance set to two, which is what I normally drive at. So I was by no means dangerously close to the truck. That's, um, I, I couldn't estimate how far that is because it is based on speed as well. But anyway, I was following this truck and it had the, the back of it was like the pleated, kind of like quilted looking shiny chrome texture. I don't know what you'd call that. And, I think that confused the car. I don't know if it confused the radar signature or if it confused the cameras or something because after I had been following that truck for maybe like 15 or 20 miles, the car started throwing all these errors related to the lane centering system and the lane changing. And uh, it just shut those systems off. I had a bunch of warning lights um, and then they went away. So they showed up for about a minute and then they disappeared. Then they came back, then they went away again, and then they came back a third time and they stayed there through the rest of my drive. Um, so when that glitch happened, all it did was affect the lane centering. Actually, I don't even know if it was, I don't know if it affected the lane centering, but it would not do the auto lane changes, but adaptive cruise was still working. Uh, fall, distance falling was still working. All that was still working. It was just the lane system had air it out. Uh, when I got home, I turned the car off. And then when I turned the car back on, all those errors were gone. So I don't know what that was about. I always suspect it was that texture on the back of the truck, but I have no, that's just a hunch. Uh, from then until about two months ago, it was flawless, including the entire time, the road trip to Florida. I also took it to Michigan earlier uh, last year and it has been flawless. But then, um, I think this was in January, it might've been February, I was driving in fairly light snow on the highway, like the roads weren't even getting slippery at all, uh, but it was building up on the front of the car. And at one point it threw an error that said, radar sensor blocked, smart cruise control canceled. This was a bigger deal than the other error because it disabled cruise control entirely. I couldn't even use manual cruise control. I figured out how to get it into a mode where it would give a max speed so I could just keep the pedal floored and it wouldn't let me get any faster, but that's not super safe in case I needed to do something evasive. So I was old school manual mode when that uh, error happened. So I pulled off the highway not too long after that and looked at the front of the car and it had maybe like three or four millimeters of sleet and snow and ice built up in front of the radar sensor. And I, and I regret this because I didn't try just power cycling the car. I cleaned it off first. Uh, so I cleaned off that snow. Then well, I had turned the car off, went out, cleaned off that snow, got back in the car, turned it back on and then it was fine. So, Yes, the radar sensor had some snow on it, but I don't know if it was enough to truly make it stop working. And the error seemed to come out of nowhere. Like the car wasn't behaving weirdly. It just um, just stopped working. And so that, that uh, I don't know if that truly was, that's too much snow. I wouldn't think so, but um, maybe it was. So I also had that, uh, that glitch. That's been it though. Um, and both, both of the errors that it threw were resolved with a turn it off and back on again. So 
uh, the first th the first time those glitches happened, I thought, oh great, some modules got a bad connection or something. I'll have to take it to the dealer. But no, I, I don't know what the heck that was about. Um, so I have experienced those two glitches. The last glitch has nothing to do with the cars driving. I have had weird um, Android auto connection issues that haven't happened in a while. And I'm not sure if it's my phone or the car. That's the fun thing about Android Auto, which is the problem. Uh, so there has been, you know, I'll be like 40 minutes into drive listening to a podcast with the map on. And then like the car starts, it disappears from Android Auto and it says phone is disconnected. And then there's like a little status bar that comes up on top of the screen. And it rapidly changes between phone disconnected, phone available, phone disconnected, phone available, which makes me think it's the car, not my phone. Um, in every case this has happened, unplugging the phone and plugging it back in fixes it, but that's weird. And I wish it didn't happen. It has only happened like three times to me, maybe four, and it hasn't happened in a while, uh, but that is something to report. Those are it as far as my glitches. So if you count every single thing you could consider was a problem with the car, um, I have encountered five. The 12 volt battery discharge bug, the charge scheduling, which I can't rely on, two highway driving assist glitches, and the Android auto weirdness. All of them are quite minor if you ask me. So I would call that a good batting average. Um, so yeah, that's been my my total experience with issues. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything other, anything else noteworthy to talk about because it has really been just like tiny little errors uh, that really don't matter. No, so let's just move on to my gripes with the car because I do have a few. Um, the first is, Despite me having the top of the line car with the upgraded stereo, it's not that great. It could be better. Um, mainly it's lacking treble output. I um, I am not a bass head, whatever you, I'm not all about that bass, about that bass. I like some, but I'm actually very much like the clarity. And when the car's default settings are bad, it was like really muffled and I've, I should have looked at it, but I, I I dialed it in as best as I can, but I'm pretty sure I have the mid-range all the way down. It's just, the it was really boomy with no clarity. And I was like, is this what people want these days? But I've heard a lot of people have had similar assessment of its stereo. It's just okay. Um, so I don't listen to music all that much in the car anymore. So it's not, I mostly listen to podcasts, so it doesn't... <laughs> It's a minor gripe, but it is like, for what you're paying for the car, I think it should have a better stereo. My 2013 Volt, I was very impressed with its stereo. It had the upgraded Bose stereo. And this car also has a Bose branded stereo, but it is not that good. So bummer there. Uh, the next gripe is the heated and ventilated seat controls are in the touchscreen. Um, the car has a decent set of physical controls for like, like the climate control. They're not physical controls. It is a touch panel, but it's always there. It's separate from the touch screen, but the heated seat controls are in a sub menu of the climate control. All is not terrible though, because there is a button called warmer and you touch that and it brings you, this is on the uh, climate control panel, you touch the button that says warmer, it brings you straight to that screen. Uh, the heated steering wheel control is also there. So for me, it's not a big deal because there is a, there are also two buttons that you can program to do any number of, there's a few things you can tell it to do. And the star button I have programmed to go back to Android Auto. So for the most part, what, what ends up being is I get in the car, hit warmer, make the adjustment, hit star. Would it be better if it had dedicated buttons for all those things? Yes, uh, but there is a shortcut. Early on, all the automotive journalists were missing that button. Uh, so they'd complain these, uh, these controls are buried in the menu, but like there is a direct shortcut there. And Hyundai has now fixed it because I've noticed on the Ionic 6 and likely the next model year, the 5, the button doesn't say warmer anymore. 
being all cryptic, it shows the seat and the steering wheel. So good job, they fixed that. Um, the car really should have a rear wiper. So it doesn't have a rear wiper and Hyundai claimed, oh, we've done this aero treatment with the rear spoiler and it's gonna uh, create an air curtain over the glass like a sedan, so it doesn't need a rear wiper. No, that's baloney. It really could use a rear wiper. Um, is it a deal breaker for me? No, uh, but it is it is problematic. Using the rear defroster helps, um, and the timer on it is very generous. It's 10 or 15 minutes, so you don't have to keep turning it on all the time. But it should have a rear wiper, and I believe it's going to get one in 2024. The, the first pictures of the Ionic 5N, it has a rear wiper, so I, I think they're realizing, oops, we should have done that. Um, for me, it's not a big deal in the rain because you can see enough out the back to... When you are at speed, it's not... The, the air current effect kind of helps. You don't get, like, big blotchy messes in the in the water. It's more like you have, a like, a fine mist on the window, so it's not so bad. But when you... If you are somewhere where they use road salt and you're driving in that muck, uh, it's going to get... It's going to coat the back glass and you're gonna barely be able to see out of it. So last winter, I found myself cleaning the back glass a few times, but this winter, because, you know, we've gotten so little snow and I, I didn't have to drive in most of the conditions, it, it wasn't a big deal. Um, the next thing is a problem that I'm going to make a video about, because it's not specific to this car. Um, the way the brake lights behave when you are using one pedal driving is dangerous uh, and not acceptable. So I have stopped using the iPedal mode because it, it's, it's not good. So the reason this is turning into a main video topic is because going to the Bolt. So it has had since 2017 a very good one pedal drive mode. You Because GM is GM, you engage it by moving the shifter to L. It's a shifter out of a Buick and they just reused low gear for the one pedal drive mode. Um, and the way the bolt handled it always seemed overly complicated. I don't know if it used an accelerometer or if it was just, it had a lookup table of deceleration curves, but the brake lights would come on if the car were slowing down by any significant degree, but then they would go out when you had come to a stop. I was not the biggest fan of that behavior because here in the U.S. where everybody's got an automatic transmission, uh, your brake lights are usually on when the vehicle is stopped. And I was always a little bit, like during the day when the back of the car is not lit up with taillights, uh, if you're stopped at a, at a light or an intersection or something and the brake lights aren't lit, I'm always a little bit worried about that. So I always thought the bolts arrangement was weirdly overly complicated, like just make it so that when when the pedal, when the accelerator pedal is in the first 10%, turn on the brake lights, you know? So like, so long as the accelerator pedal is above the neutral point, turn on the brake lights. Well, Hyundai kind of did that, but that this car only turns on the brake lights when you are completely off the gas pedal. And in iPedal mode, you can be decelerating quite aggressively without having your foot completely off the pedal, and the brake lights will not be lit. Uh, I, I, one of my first concerns was how do the brake lights behave, so at night I took it out and was watching the third brake light in the, in the mirror, and it truly does not come on until you are completely off the gas pedal. That is just not good, and um, I, if you have an Ionic 5, I would encourage you to maybe not use iPedal mode most of the time. Because the issue is, yes, you can just let your foot off the gas and the brake lights will come on, but that is a, it's really uncomfortable to drive the car that way because it's very rubber bandy. Um, and just like sudden deceleration to get the brake lights to come on. It's not good. And um, so I'm, I'm planning to make a main channel video about this is a new problem that we probably need to agree on some rules for because Neither of those two behaviors are perfect. The bolts is better. I would rather have some sort of deceleration-based uh, 
activation of the brake lights and have them go out when you're at a stop, then my cars knew, yeah, they stay on whenever you're off the gas, but you need to be completely off the gas. And there are, you can be uh, really aggressively slowing down without your foot completely off the pedal. So now uh, the car has a blended braking system. So you can leave it in level one regen. Uh, currently, there's a really bizarre, uh, my car, if you put it in level zero regen, that disables regen entirely. So then the brakes, the brake pedal doesn't do anything but friction brakes. I have no idea why they did that. I, I don't know if a software update is gonna fix that um, or if that's something they assume some people would want. So if you have an Ionic 5, never, ever, ever put it in level zero regen because you will lose all regen. It's dumb. Uh, but level one is a very, very light regen. It's practically like, it's practically nothing. It's probably about what a car with an automatic is going to uh, decelerate when you let off the gas. So I would recommend probably driving it in level one, two, or three. I normally drive it in three now because a sudden let off of the accelerator is not so jarring. Uh, so I'm able to do that. Uh, but that's that's a problem that they, they need to fix. Um, and in general, the car industry needs to be a little more uh, aware of how the brake lights behave as we do these one pedal driving modes. Um, and of course, the other thing with the brake lights in North America, it has a combined stop and turn light, which bothers me ever so much. Um, my understanding as far as why, because with, this is the only market where it's like that. In the rest of the world, of course, it has separate amber strips. And the taillights are actually very different because there's four rows of pixels. And in most of the world, the top three are your brake lights and the bottom row is your turn signal. But here, all four rows are brake lights. And the way there's a row of like frosted pixels, there's like a little circle going around the, the brake lights. And then the center bits are more of, they're more of a lens type thing. So. The frosted ones are not a directed light. They're the tail lights. The middle ones are more focused light. Those are the brake lights. My understanding is, and I think it was V Westlife who first uh, got me along this path, we have a minimum area requirement for our signal lamps, which is much larger than most other countries. So not only do they have to be a certain brightness, but they have to be a certain size. And so what likely was the case is that the European setup, the brake light, the only thing that counts as a brake light is that inner part that is not frosted. And because you can only count the part that's off of the hatch, it's very small. So my presumption is that the European brake lights are too small to count as brake lights here. So they had to make entirely new taillight modules. It's stupid, and it's a regulation that we need to fix. Um, but that's probably why we have combined stop and turn here, because the, the brake lights are too small. Uh, and then my last gripe has to do with Highway Driving Assist. There are a couple behaviors that I think it could do better. Uh, the first thing is, it does not give you any audible warning when it has lost confidence in the lane markers. This is bad. Um, it will ding if it shuts off, uh, but if, for instance, it doesn't have a good view of the lane lines, you will see the blue lines in the head-up display, which, by the way, haven't even talked about. The car has an excellent heads-up display, at least in my trim. I think it's exclusive to the premium. It might be in the SEL, but the heads-up display is amazing. Some people have complained that the steering wheel covers the speedometer on the main display. It doesn't for me, but even if it did, I pretty much don't look at the main display at all when I'm driving. The heads-up display is that great. It even shows, um, it shows you awareness of other cars around you and has an indicator for the blind spot monitors, which is fantastic. It's fantastic. Um, uh, but anyway, so you see these blue lines surrounding the road, which tell you it is locked in the center. They will sometimes disappear and the car, the auto steer, stops working. You don't get any sort of audible notice about that. Now, I am not confident about this, but I believe lane keep assist is still functioning. So I believe it's gonna ping pong you, it's gonna keep you from crossing over the lane line, but it doesn't keep you centered. 
So I don't think that is necessarily terrible because it, like I said, if it disables the HDA, it does do a double ding. Um, and then of course it starts slowing down, but it, it does bother me that it loses the centering ability and doesn't warn you. To be clear, that doesn't happen very often. It's like on interstates, it practically never happens, but you can use the auto steer feature on any road. Um, it, it doesn't call itself, I don't quite get the distinction because there says HDA and HDA nav in green. The nav only comes on on like interstates, but like on uh, state routes that aren't mapped, you can still use the auto steer function. So I don't quite get that distinction. Um, anyway, the auto steer, my presumption is that lane keep assist is still on. I think it's using the cameras in the side mirrors because they're looking down at the road. I think it can see the lane line. So that might be what's going on is that it still knows where the where the lane lines are, but it doesn't have a good view out of the front camera, so it can't keep you locked in and centered. That's speculation on my part. The whole point I'm getting at is it loses confidence and it doesn't necessarily tell you it did. But I don't think it's gonna let you drift into the other lane. So I'm it's not a deal breaker to me, but it does concern me. The other thing with the HDA system, which is just annoying, is if so it's good about like um the first car i ever drove with adaptive cruise was a ford fusion rental um and that car is if someone like cut you off it would basically slam on the brakes to get you back to the following distance you had set and it was very aggressive bad bad no good so this car if someone cuts you off it does you know slow down to match their speed but then it gradually eases you back off the car, which is good. That's how it should work. But if you say you get out of your lane, what tends to happen is like, say I get over to the left to pass someone seemingly like seven out of 10 times, I will get behind someone who's just passed me and the car will not accelerate back up to my set speed until my set distance has been elapsed. So I hope, or has been reached. So I hope that makes sense. So like say my set speed is 73. I'm stuck behind someone going 70. I can't get over yet because someone is currently passing me, but as soon as they pass me, I signal to get over. So my car gets over. It stays at 70 until my following distance is matched with the car passing me, which kind of makes sense. But the problem is it always it gets in this weird catch up problem because then the car is at your following distance and now you're still going 70. So it gets farther away and then you end up catching up with that car. I don't like that. It's the main reason I don't like it is because if I'm in heavy traffic and I wanna not heavy traffic, if I'm in enough traffic where like I need to get into the next lane and accelerate quickly because there's someone coming up behind me, the car just won't. So I often end up stepping on the gas to force it to accelerate. Um, I wish that behavior were better. Uh, the other thing, so that's related um, to, the, to the first thing. So every time it doesn't accelerate until you are at, at that following distance. And related to that, this seems to happen. This is the thing is that like, I can't figure out why it does this sometimes and doesn't others. Cause just uh, yesterday I actually got over into the right lane cause uh, my exit was coming up. And as I signaled right, the car started accelerating um, as soon as I signaled right. So sometimes it's aware enough of traffic to be, to, to be willing to do that or else either that lane was completely clear and I knew that. Anyway, it could use some refinement there. I think it needs to, you know, if it, it's aware of other traffic, it actually shows you diagrams in the displays of the cars going around you, which is cool. I would think it should know that car is going five, six miles an hour faster than I am. So as soon as I'm behind them, start inching up in speed. You don't have to wait until they are X many feet away from me. Um, and the thing is, this mainly happens when the highway driving assist feature is turned on. If I don't have the lane 
uh, centering, and I'm just using it like adaptive cruise control. Then if I signal left, it immediately accelerates. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit wonky. I wish it, that could use some refinement, but overall, the highway driving assist is excellent. It's always locked in the center. The, um, the way it handles traffic um, and the, the radar sensor, it's never done something that like concerns me. Uh, and it's, it is very, very much like, it's very impressive. Um, the car is almost driving itself, but don't ever say it is. Do not lull yourself into thinking the car is driving itself because it's not. You are in control of the car. And they should make that clear with language like assist or super cruise or anything other than that other word. Uh, we don't need to rehash that. Um, yeah. That might be the end. I've been going on for a while. I've gone through everything, right? So the 12 volt battery bug, charge scheduling, I talked about the software update, my collision repair experience, I needed to get a new tire, there was the scuff on the paint, talked about how it drives, love it. Talked about the heat pump, great. Talked about the glitches with the highway driving assist feature, the Android auto weirdness, and my gripes. Would I buy the car again? Absolutely. And unfortunately it doesn't qualify for the tax credit and likely won't. Um, possibly ever again. I'm a little surprised. I just saw some news actually that there might be an agreement to let cars built in Japan qualify. So maybe the Korean makes will get that uh, handed to them. Um, but also the Hyundai and Kia are trying to move production here. The, the, e, the Kia EV9 is going to be built here soon. That's an impressive car. Um, kind of big, but looks impressive. Uh, and I, you know, we don't, I don't want to get into that, uh, that whole thing, but, um, cause it's contentious, but, um, I was lucky enough to buy it before the rules changed. So I am getting the tax credit and, but even it's still a very good car and the charging, the, the fast charging is amazing. Uh, the vehicle to load feature is great. There's a lot of things about, about the car. So it's a huge bummer that it doesn't have the tax credit anymore. But like compared to a Volkswagen ID4, I think it's a much better car. I've never, I've never driven an ID4. I don't dislike the ID4. I have a neighbor who has one. And every time I see it, I'm like, you know what? That's a, that's a nice looking car. I, I actually quite like it. I almost got one. Uh, it wasn't until the Ionic 5 was announced. So, but, I was going to talk about this. I'll, I'll tack it on the end. The reason I was able to get it so early was um, basically the, the first time I saw the car, I saw a video overview of it, I think, before Doug DeMiro did his. So I saw an early one and I saw it and I was like, yes, that. And I made it a, I made a reservation immediately. So I was in the uh, insider program and uh, I put $100 down and that's how I got it so quickly. Um, and I didn't get it that soon in the US, but for Illinois, I, I was in the first allotment that my dealer ever got. And the only weird thing is the way that Hyundai, um, when you signed up for it, the, like my expectation versus reality was quite different because when I put the deposit down, Hyundai was like, tell us how you would like the car. And at that time, we didn't know so many of the details. Um, like we didn't know yet that the rear wheel drive models would not get a heat pump. So I said, I want to get the uh, rear wheel drive limited in white with the green on gray interior. And I assumed that they were going to send one of those to the dealer. But no, what happened was when it finally came time to pick up the car, they said, hey, we're getting you in contact with this dealer. They'll call you shortly. I got a call a couple days later and it was like, hey, we got these five coming in, which do you want? <laughs> so it was not what I expected. Um, it, Cause Hyundai even said like when I made the reservation, if you want to change your preferences, just um, let us know. And I did, when I learned that the all wheel drive would have a heat pump, I changed to all wheel drive. Um, but that in the end didn't mean anything at all. I don't know if that was just because of my dealer or maybe I picked a color because the white, I don't know, maybe they don't sell any of the limiteds in white, but they let me pick that. That was just a weird, 
<laughs> not what I thought was going to be the case. But um, uh, yeah, I, I just, I got the car very, very early because of that. Um, and I'm happy because I got the tax credit. But yeah, I, I've been talking for over an hour, right? I think so. I didn't expect the video to be this long. <laughs> Maybe people aren't going to want to watch it. I'll put chapters in. Why am I just doing... Should I stop? Yeah, I'll stop. Thanks for watching.